Paul would uh, welcome to this conversation. It's so terrific to see you. And I feel that this is an ongoing conversation into the future, but we've been in dialogue for 20 years now since the Harvard conferences on world religions and ecology and our marvelous collaboration of the conference called the Communion of Subjects that brought together religion, animal, animal behavior, folks that was amazing with Kimberly Patton hosted by Duwei Ming there. So you've had a remarkable journey yourself from law uh, and practice in Southern California to getting a PhD in religious studies to further study in Oxford um, and to setting up a remarkable animal behavior, animal studies program at Canisius. But you've taught at Harvard Law School, you've taught here at Yale um, as well. So give us just a little further uh, detail on the thread of your own journey into this area of appreciating, understanding our animal kin. Actually, my journey starts a little more with religion than law, although law comes fairly early. And religion was in being raised Catholic, but also in becoming a religious studies major as an undergraduate, doing some graduate work at both University of Chicago and Stanford in religious studies, and then going to law school. And the law school becomes a 15-year career for me, and I, I did well in a large law firm. But I had the chance to break away from that after the success in law to go to Oxford to do, and that returned me to the religious studies side. But I also had the legal expertise, and, and Mary Evelyn, one of the things that's worked out so well for me is that uh, the, the religious studies element is not usually linked to law, but, but in the area of animal protection, each one of them is so powerful and so essential to going forward that part of my work has been to get these two diverse realms to talk to each other. So it's been a wonderful journey. And of course, communion of subjects was the way in which that voice first got to be prominent um, because of the support of the Forum on Religion and Ecology. So we're really um, so much further along the road, but it's pleasant to think back at how serendipitous, serendipitous it was for us to meet and have that, that, that uh, working together work out so wonderfully. Yes, I, I fully agree. And then even from that time, setting up the religion and animals group at the AAR, American Academy of Religion, that you worked so hard on, and now it's a flourishing group, conversation, papers, dialogue, meetings. Um, so this field has opened up um, thanks to you and, your, and other colleagues. And that's part of the beauty of this working together. And maybe we'll just say from the very beginning that we all understand, and you've helped us to understand, we're speaking about the non-human animal world because you remind us over and over again, we're all animals. But for the sake of our conversation, we will call this emerging field that you've created animal studies, um, and it brings in a whole range of, of people and disciplines and so on. But give us a little bit of a feel for what is animal studies right now? Well, I wanted that word because since humans are scientifically animals that, and you can't really study the relationship we have to other beings without studying ourselves, so I wanted to find a way to have a bridge, and animal studies looks at how humans look at other animals. Uh, one of the priority issues is, what are their realities like? Well, that's a hard inquiry for us since we're not present to them and can't speak with them usually. But we are gifted when we transcend our own idea that we're the most important. Um, instead, if we see ourselves as a, a member of a community, a communion of subjects, to that wonderful phrase from Thomas Berry, when we see that animal studies blossoms and you realize that you can understand something about your own living features by studying other animals and you can understand them better by being sensitive back and forth across that um, bridge. So animal studies today is actually quite encompassing. Uh, another way to describe it is interdisciplinary. And of course, interdisciplinary work is challenging in the modern world because we take our identity often from a single discipline. But all of us know that knowledge isn't broken up into a balkanized form. It's actually something that's quite holistic. And if you want to approach the extraordinary mystery and beauty and gift of life, it's very, very good to use multiple approaches that humans have developed. So religion works really well. Law 
I think it works less well, but it is quite important in the modern policy world. So we get in animal studies to talk about that whole wide range. But honestly, Mary Evelyn, I'm still um, working out how do we, we've bitten off a lot, how do we chew this? And the question is, well, we, this is something we'll figure out over the coming decades and centuries. Yes. Well, I love that thinking out of the box and yet synergizing, bringing in different disciplines, understanding the value and the limitations of each one of these, law, religion, uh, and so on. Uh, so, Paul, let's talk about this wonderful conference that we all shared, we created together at Oak Spring in Virginia, hosted by Peter Crane. And that was a very special conference, wasn't it, that uh, somehow things bubbled up. And I just want you to comment on, you know, what bubbled up for you there and, and why um, we were creating a living earth community. But how did that topic bring us together, living earth community? I, let me focus on the people. There were people there, Mary Evelyn, whom I'd met 10, 20, 30 times or more. And so I look so forward to seeing them because I know their character and I know how important it is to be around you and John. David Haberman, Heather Eaton, so many others there. But the other astonishing aspect was not only good friends that have been so productive for me, it was the new people who had been doing this just as long as all of us have, but I hadn't met yet. And so you get wonderfully interesting people like uh, David Haskell, Mark Turn, David Abram, Jeanette Wallace, who I still to today marvel at how, despite all the if I could say it lightheartedly, all the expertise I picked up, how much of a novice I was at their feet as I listened to them. I was so appreciative, not only of the content, but how they spoke and the energy they brought, because that, I know the energy is in the, all the people I'd already met. I, it is such a rewarding thing to, to meet new people who have been doing this for a long time and help introduce us why to, to our own understanding of why do we do this? Because something so important is at stake. So old people, new friends, what a wonderful combination that lived out what we what the actual title of that was. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. So, so well said. Um, and uh, yeah, we all came away tremendously energized. And that's what we want to share here. So let's reflect for a moment uh, from your view, living earth community. This isn't dead. These systems can't only be understood mechanistically and so on. So why, why do we go forward with that title? Um, and, and what does it mean in terms of your studies, your thinking, your writing? Well, I'll take it right back to communion of subjects. There in the Thomas Berry's work was the impetus for this. Many other people's work as well, but he has a, a playfulness a sense of mystery and sacrament that so pervades his work, you can't help but find joy in the work. Mm -hmm. There's a passage in that prologue where he, he talks about if you encounter a wild animal, and he gives a list of five or six, a butterfly, a hummingbird, a hawk, uh, a deer, a fox, and he talks about how we're blessed by that encounter, we're healed by it, we're forgiven by it, we're transported by it, and I think, wow, all of those are such really accurate descriptions, but it's multivalent. And in the living earth, I think the thing that mattered and why I mentioned old friends and new friends was the living qualities of, of relationship in the past and the development of new ones and creating community, which is the fundamental message that we're taking about getting beyond the species line to whole systems and to your sense Thomas's sense of the beauty of it all and the mystery, of course, and the humility that it takes to approach that, and yet the reward of joy. I find that combination formidable in life, and I can tell when I teach, it's what matters to me is to convey to my students that they too can experience all of those elements. Yes, yeah, fantastic. Um, and tell us a little bit about what you did create at Canisius, this new animal studies program, and how vivifying it is for students, both online students and in-class students, right? 
Well, it's been a success demographically in the sense that there's a huge applicant pool and there are very impressive people coming. And I could tell when I had people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s who uh, said, I, I've done, I, I've made a success in the world, but now I want to find something that's personally meaningful. And Mary Evelyn, the dynamics inside the class when people have the freedom to pursue, particularly their connection to other living beings, is one that I think. Um, works really well to bring awareness of why religious traditions have been doing that at their best. And of course, at their worst, they don't do it. But um, law at its best can do it, but at its worst doesn't. And same with ethics and same with science. Each one of these has the ability to transport us, heal us, forgive us for our arrogance and bring us into, you know, that wonderful Aldo Leopold phrase about being uh, plain, responsible citizens in the world, humans haven't been so good at this collectively, but individually, we have often had this insight. Religious traditions, I think, being the home of that most anciently, where you find extraordinary figures who have lived a life that you, too, can think about and choose for yourself and for those in your local community. So for me, um, there's the material is everywhere. It isn't surprising that human living beings have been fascinated with others. That's true across the board. But we live in a society where we privilege the human so much that we've lost contact, ironically, with ourselves as well as the other living beings. Yeah. So let's uh, just take apart that phrase a little bit or open it up that we all love, a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. Uh, that describes the universe, the earth, according to Thomas Berry. And it was the title of your book from... Columbia that brought all these papers together. So how do you, what, what's your thinking about, feeling about a communion of subjects? What does that mean? I think it means in your local world, you have available to you by walking out into your yard along a, a river, if there's one nearby you, hopefully to some place that's relatively pristine because it'll be particularly clear there. You have the chance to connect. You as a living being, as a participant in that system, it is mysterious. It, it begs of us to knock off the uh, belief that human intelligence is the paradigm. We are one form of intelligence, but as you wrote in that wonderful paper for a community of subjects, there are multiple intelligences. Now, one of the things that to me, Mary Evelyn, is most important is that many of the indigenous communities live in a way that points out that when you are you encounter another animal, that's a gift from the other animal, a gift. That gift mentality is really quite important. And I learned that when I walked in my local world, if I would just stay open to that, I'd walk carefully, quietly, so not to disturb them. And when they did appear, I could feel inside why the gift image works so perfectly. In my culture, I was never taught to see things that way. But once you open up to that, you realize indigenous cultures have many forms of wisdom that we can use. We also have them as well. And the question is, how do we live those out fully? So a community of subjects to me, me often means go experience it. It's, it's, in, it's ubiquitous. It's in your local world. Now, of course, it's in the larger ecosystems and climate change discussions. But if we can do all levels, local and further away, I think we actually begin to grasp why there has been such a sense of the world as sacramental, as mysterious, as full of meaning and encounter for us. Right. So Teilhard de Chardin called, spoke about a divine milieu or hymn of the universe. And the Chinese would speak about this as resonance, a reciprocal resonance between qi, matter energy in the world. So we're in contact with these living systems, these living beings. So let's dig a little deeper um, about this topic of intelligence or sentience. And as we begin to understand more and more, and scientists have been exploring this for quite a few decades, but something seems to be breaking through uh, even more broadly into human consciousness that we're not the only thinking creatures. Now, of course, consciousness or intelligence has multiple forms, but a migrating consciousness of caribou, of salmon, of turtles, and, and so on. There's a, a range of consciousnesses. So can you give us a feeling for this and how we're beginning to embrace this 
sense of kin uh, consciousnesses in the world around us? Yes, I, I think, let, let me start with science because we often think of science as a very disciplined area and it, it needs those disciplines in order to do its important work. In 2016, Franz de Waal published a book. He's the leading expert on primate, primate intelligence and other animals' intelligence. He's certainly one of the leaders. And the title of the book is, Are We Smart Enough to Figure Out How Smart Other Animals Are? Are we smart enough to figure out how smart they are? Now, that is a, a very teasing uh, title for a very powerful, almost arrogant scientific tradition. Are we smart enough? And it turns out we are. We are in one circumstance, and that's when we're humble about our own intelligence as one among others, elegant, beautiful, prone to arrogance. <laughs> but it is beautiful and it works quite well. Uh, it strikes me also that the idea of gift comes there again. You, in order to notice other kinds of intelligence, you need to go humbly to the world. You need to let that world be itself. You can't force yourself on it. You can't destroy the habitat. You can't just walk blindly into the area. You have to be a responsible member of that local community. For me, Mary Evelyn, it is a stunning thing to have had such a good education, but for so long to have not been told anything about non-human animals, not anything. So the, one of the reasons I was interested in a community of subjects and in religion and animals and law and animals was could we take these powerhouse academic disciplines, law, science, ethics, religion, and get them to use their own internal resources, the ancient ones, to help re-educate us, to bring us back to becoming really responsible, plain citizens in the world. And my sense, Mary Evelyn, as I've done this is, it is totally, it's the only way for us to self-actualize. We cannot fully actualize when we isolate ourselves off, but we can when we become responsible community members. And to me, that's the fundamental message. And it is, it's an intellectual proposition, but I'm telling you, as you know, you use that in the class and students take charge of their own learning and begin to soar. And nothing is better in education than when your students begin to, on their own terms, search in ways that you yourself have been searching. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Um, yeah, and you think of very iconic uh, people in the scientific world like Jane Goodall, and why is she probably the best known scientist on the planet? Because she had a relationship with these chimps, right? Of course, she named them, and even that was unheard of at the time. But there's some, the element of feeling, of relationality, of studying, of course, their tool making and a range of things. But, you know, just, just give us a feel for how Jane Goodall, for example, has moved this field uh, forward so rapidly. You know, she's a phenomenon when you're around her. And you, you can see how much other people pay attention to her, and she's quite gentle and not brash. Um, uh, I think I don't think it's an accident that Jane Goodall, Baruti Galdikas, and Diane Fossey were the three uh, primatologist-focused uh, st students who brought us into much more awareness of how special primate societies and intelligence and emotions are, and that's partly because. Uh, the males had picked up the sort of male, uh, we're the paradigm, and anything that doesn't meet us isn't really worth consideration. Whereas Jane, uh, Baruti Galdikas, and Diane Fossey, all natively, in very different contexts, were able to see other living beings, um, not just on their terms, but primarily on their terms, but also factoring in human ability to see. So Jane figured out she's a primate, she could become friends, and she did. Mm -hmm. And she was criticized for that because we were trying to be so emotionally detached. How do you pursue a subject with passion and be emotionally detached? It's a very complex balance to strike. Science can do that, I think, really well, but it, it must always leave room for our full humanity. And that is everything to do with our connection, our community, not just with each other, not with just like humans, but with all humans and all mammals and keep going. And it's any wonder. I don't know where the border there is, Mary Evelyn, but I know this, it's way beyond the species line. Yes, I love that. I love that. And um, that's the, 
celebration that we're yes. experiencing in our time. The Hall of Biodiversity at the Natural History Museum is just an explosion of this immense creativity, especially from the last 65 million years of life forms. You know, um, the other person I wanted to just draw in here, um, our magnificent visit to Richard Wrangham's um, lab oh, yeah. at Harvard and the involvement that you've had with the Great Apes Project and what Richard was trying to do there. Can you describe that the project and, and this the mapping there of Africa and, and how are we going to preserve, conserve our, our closest kins, the great, the great apes? Yeah, let yeah. me use the image of poster children. I think the other great apes, since humans are the fifth great ape species, are kind of poster children for some bad things as well as good. First of all, they're intelligent, wonderful. Orangutans are richly intelligent in ways that made the local people think they were people of the forest. Um, um, I, I, the Great Ape Project, I got involved in because I was quite interested in, ironically, cetaceans. And I thought, if we cannot get fundamental protections for our fellow great apes, I don't think there's much chance for helping cetaceans. So let's come close to our own kind and help people recognize, wow, there are a lot of bearers of consciousness in the world who are not human. And cetaceans being the great mammals of the oceans. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so the great apes were studied quite carefully, again, for the ironic reason to learn about our origins. Mm -hmm. By doing that, we discovered they had culture, intelligence, Deception. Yes, they actually are our cousins. <laughs> so, so I found I did that for ten years with Peter Singer. I got a chance to meet Jane and work with Jane Goodall. That was a rich, rich time in my life, and I still work on the cetacean, the whales and dolphins piece. But what that really did for me, Mary Evelyn, was help me see how difficult it is. How you have to go into law to yeah. do this. Yeah. You have to go into religious establishments as well as the actual day to day life of religious people. You certainly need ethics. For heaven's sakes, you're going blind if you don't have science. Now, how do we combine those? Well, first of all, nobody's an expert in all of those things. And the question is, so you better do it communally. And I think one of the things that has helped me soar, is certainly you and I have talked about this many times, is that inside the Forum on Religion and Ecology, thousand plus people who are these warm, open-hearted, engage you, ask you about yourself, tell you about themselves. That kind of community is, to me, the model, the model for what animal studies needs to do. Yes, I love that um, because we're creating communities within communities and, and so on, right? And that's the beauty of it, um, that uh, as we do that, we feel something of our uniqueness, but even more something of our connectedness, right? Because we are such social mammals and, and we need that. Um, so just to maybe conclude here, um, you know, so many people have their companion animals and you've loved dogs all your life and, and so on. So just give us a feel for the delight, the play and what, what dogs are in, in your life with, with Judith. Well, I've gone about two and a half years without a dog right now. And um, I used to, when I was asked, are you a dog person or a cat person? That's a common question. I'd say I'm definitely a dog person. And it turns out in the last two and a half years, I've been a cat person because we have a young cat who is, oh, so marvelous. But I have had the privilege of being around a lot of wonderful dogs. And, and I know people who are dog people. And um, I don't think there's any question that the human dog relationship is, a because we co-evolved together for so many years, they are the only other animal that when a human points the do dogs innate, innately have the ability to understand what that a human is not pointing at the end of their finger, they're pointing at something along that trajectory. Dogs are quite good at that. They're very good at body language. In this sense, they are our, our teachers. And anybody who's, I think, been sensitive to dogs recognizes they're individuals. Some are so one way and some another. Um, I, I, I do think in many ways, and I've written about this, that companion animals open the door. And I like to say it this way, Mary Evelyn, there are a huge percentage of people in, in the industrialized world who will say, oh, my dog is a family member. Now, that is terrible biology. That's not correct. <laughs> but it is wonderful ethics. And it's wonderful ethics in the sense of getting back to some of the things we've been talking about. How 
your encounter with another living being that's outside of our species can transport you, heal you, help you soar. And once you start doing that, you look around, you realize, oh, there are so many more opportunities like this. Now that's the communion of subjects. It's a joyful, mysterious, humbling place. One final comment. Someone said, who's your favorite animal? And I said, well, I suppose I really should say in one circumstance, particularly it's humans, and that's when humans are humble and reaching out. Humans are tough animals when they're not humble. I suppose maybe all animals are. But I like the, the breadth and depth of humans who have come home to the fact that we're one citizen among others, that there is a community of subjects. When that happens, Mary Evelyn, it makes conferences like the Living Earth Conference, it makes it a, an opportunity I cannot give to myself, no matter how disciplined I am, that joy of being in, in that dance, that wonderful listening to d debates. And of course there were disagreements, but there were beautiful interactions that are the kind of things that sustain me. And that, so thank you. That, that opportunity is something I've learned. Oh, whenever that chance arises, please be present, Paul. So, well, so thank you. And you added so much to the dialogue, to the spontaneity, the play um, that came forward and joy. And that um, will sustain us for the work ahead. So, Paul, we're deeply grateful for your work, for your writing, and everything you're still going to create with our flourishing Earth community. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mary Evelyn. Thank you for everything. And I truly mean everything. <laughs> <laughs>